Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Grow Shop Show where we talk about scaling without the bullshit. Today I'm uh, unbelievably excited to be talking to a gentleman by the name of, my, uh, I was going to say Mike Taylor, but Michael Taylor, known on the streets as Mike Taylor. Mike uh, has a really interesting background and we've connected a few times. I think it's over, it's probably not two years, but I've had exposure to what you've been doing for a really long time. So Mike is a technical marketer. He's done it for over a decade. He's managed over 50 million worth of media spend. I was looking up a comparison of this. I always like to have like a, a reference point. And <laughs> let me pull it up. And I've got a question for you to guess. I was looking up countries yeah, by nominal. You're going to blow me away now and uh, tell me how much media spend you guys do. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm comparing. <laughs> no, you're, we're going to blow everybody listening away by comparing the amount of media spend that you've done uh, to countries by GDP. And how, oh, wow. yeah, these, these are the, these are the unnecessary things that I spend my time thinking about. <laughs> Guess what the GDP of the Dominican Republic is. Oh, I thought it'd be pretty high. Like, I don't know. It's actually pretty hundred million? Yeah, 500 million actually. So that kind of ruins my, okay. that ruins my reference point. But there's a, there's there a, one, one tenth of the GDP. Yeah. So if you take 10, if you yeah, take 10 of Republic, um, uh, I've spent all of their money for a year. Yeah, you've burnt through it. There, there is a little island called Tuvalu, which I've never heard of. It's got one of the, it's got a, a Union Jack on it. So you guys commandeered it at some point, and they do fifty-seven. Yeah, They've got fifty-seven million. So the amount of media spent that Mike Taylor has managed is nearly equal to the entire GDP of the island of Tuvalu. So there we go. There's a fun uh -huh. fact. It's pretty cool. Although I, I spent over ten years there. So, uh... <laughs> ten years there. Yeah, so it's not quite. And, it's, and it wasn't my money either, so um, it was just that, you know, somehow convinced people to trust me with it. There we go. So negotiating tactics are equal to your media management. There we go. <laughs> there, there's the talent. So uh, where I first got exposure to Mike was with his, his unbelievable growth agency, which a lot of people have probably heard of, which is called Ladder, which he scaled to 50 people. But what was, what was cool about what you did there, before we go into the detail of what Ladder actually did, was being very transparent and sharing the entire journey of how you actually build these things. Because back when you guys were building it, growth agencies didn't really exist, and not in this kind yeah. of full service world. So it was creating a new model where in those days, the old agencies are like, yeah, no, I'll just take a 15% rip your media spend. There's a mass misalignment of incentive and you guys uh, really, really changed the game up there. Mike is now working on his really, really cool company called Vex Power. So, Mike, it'd be good if you could share a little bit about yourself and fill in those gaps uh, and just what's going on. Take it away. Yes, sure. So, um, so yeah, I, I call myself now a recovering agency owner uh -huh. uh, because <laughs> I think every agency owner knows uh, it's it's a lot of brute force to get an agency to scale that much. Um, and uh, that was really, really fun. Like we did it over six years. But, uh, but then after that, I was... You know, getting to the point where I was like managing people who manage other people who manage yeah. other people and I wasn't really doing marketing uh, so much anymore and not really you know doing the technical side uh, so I, I left last year actually timed it perfectly I left uh, in March uh, 2020 which is right when the <laughs> pandemic kicked off uh, so <laughs> yeah <laughs> my foresight isn't great on that one but, um, uh, but it did give me a lot of cover to basically mess around for a year uh, and uh, you know did some Consulting, uh, got better at coding, and then started to build a tech company, which is you know every every uh, agency owner's dream mm. is like one day I'm going to get recurring revenue and I won't have to deal with yeah. clients anymore. I don't know. Yeah. You, you seem to enjoy it though, yeah, uh, yeah. a lot more than I did. <laughs> yeah, my own MRR. There we go. And now it's happening. yeah, yeah. I, I like making money while you sleep is uh, yeah always very appealing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then in the beginning. It's making money while no. In the beginning, it's making no money while not sleeping, and then there's the inflection. Yes. <laughs> then there's, there's the inflection point. Uh, but it looks like what yeah. you guys have built is is going to be a really big deal. It's very very cool. Yeah, I mean, it stems really from the experience of ladder. Like the you know, hardest thing uh, for agencies is hiring. So one way to solve the hiring problem is you just hire people at a more junior level and then mm -hmm. train them up. Yeah. Uh, so we we have spent a bunch of time and money on education. Yeah, uh, and that kind of really became our secret sauce. And you know, not only were we educating our, our team, and and that helped us a lot with clients, but we also you know pumped our content on our blog. We're educating 
the industry uh, as much as we could on, on what was working for us. So, yeah. uh, so it made sense that I start an education company after this. Yeah. Uh, but the, um, the the kind of the interesting thing is it's kind of like a spin on the model. Uh, I call this um, like a simulator based course. Mm. Uh, so you have, but you probably have like cohort based courses, yeah. like that's all the rage right now. Um, you know where you uh, kind of all sign up and you go through a cohort together. Um, I never really liked that. Like I, I always wanted things to be self paced. I can never yeah. really commit to you know being in a classroom, uh, even if it's remote, at the same time as everyone else. Uh, so I wanted an engaging experience, but something where you can actually like work through a challenge, like on the mm. job training, but uh, without having to like pester your manager. Yeah. Uh, and take up their time so uh, right. so that's what we built and you know we have the first six seven courses live now and uh, just kind of right. trying to get it out there and scale it up amazing man it's, uh, yeah, I, yeah i think it's such a phenomenal idea and we're going to go deeper into that as well as a few other things so we're going to go into the story of ladder and then mike is going to yeah. share some of his nuggets of wisdom which I'm also interested to hear about directly. Yeah, sure. Uh, then we've yeah. got a real hottie. Yeah, which I know people, are, <laughs> I know everybody wants to talk about iOS 14. There aren't many as qualified oh, yeah. as, as Mike to share some pieces there with, with broken tracking and broken hearts. So you, you can become like the late night therapist to people on, on today's show. Oh, unless, yeah, unless, unless, unless you've got I, bad I, news. I had my heart broken. I was, I was, uh, I was um, you know, I was working primarily on tracking uh, as a consultant at Paralyzed Ladder. So, yeah. uh, so I saw all this stuff coming and I was like, ah, this is going to be a bloodbath. <laughs> and that was really what kind of led me to, um, you know, some of the solutions that uh, we built courses for in Vexpower. Mm. So, Amazing. Uh, so yeah, kind of, you know, worked out for it in the end. It's all tying in. Phenomenal. So I'm, I'm excited for that part. Then we're going to go into what in the Dickens is marketing mix modeling. Looking forward to mm. that as well. And the big piece here is that this can this can save your Kevin Bacon. I, I really think so because I've I've focused on marketing mix modeling uh, quite a bit in the last three four years. And oh, cool! Yeah, I was going to ask if you guys were using it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's been a really big part of it. So it'd be fun. I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts there, and it'd be really interesting talking about how to to talk through how you're thinking about it. Then, lastly, here's one to improve yourself. It's how to become a true data driven marketer. And then that's obviously mm. going to plug the wonderful, the wonderful Vex. So that's it. So let's take a trip back to Ladder. <laughs> so how, how did you yeah. get to the point where you decided to start an agency and then to start something completely new? And what was what was the whole experience like early on? Yeah, good question. You know, I like I would describe myself as a entrepreneur at that point, right? Like I always wanted to start a company. I just didn't know what. And I was always like daydreaming different ideas of like, Oh, we'll build this product or like invent this thing. And, um, and, and honestly, uh, I ended up starting this company by accident, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I, I always kept, um, you know, shooting down my own ideas and saying, Oh, I can't do this because this company's just started doing it. And, you know, and, and like, Oh, this doesn't have enough of a moat. Uh, and then I end up starting an agency, which has no moat, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, tens of thousands of agencies in the world. And it's very hard to like differentiate from, from them. Um, uh, but uh, it was really just because I was moving to New York. I, uh, my my girlfriend at the time, I got offered a job out there. I, I'm actually half American. I, I, I didn't know that. I, I there anymore. we go. But, uh, but yeah, my dad's from Texas and my mom was from Liverpool. God bless, <laughs> so, God bless Texas. Yeah, quite, quite a mix. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so uh, so I, I was like, yeah, let's go. Let's go to New York for a few years. Quit my job. Uh, the day I quit my job, my boss at the time, uh, a guy called Alex Embry, I, I think maybe maybe New York. Yeah, talked about. yeah, we met. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he, um, so he also quit his job uh, and was like, "Let's start an agency together." Uh, and that was how it worked. So <laughs> yeah. I was in New York, like in my sweatpants, optimizing Facebook ads, and he was in London talking to clients. Yeah. And when when did John get involved? Was John there from the beginning? Oh yeah. So John came in. Um, I think it was about six, seven months in. Right. Uh, so we were still didn't really know what we were offering. We had been we actually you know quite lucky for an agency. We got our first five clients uh, from a partner called BBH, yeah. uh, part of Publicist Group. Um, so they they incubated us essentially. They said you know give us some equity, we'll give you our five worst clients, uh, <laughs> smallest clients. <laughs> which you know for us it was great. It's, um, it's yeah. straight away we did yeah. salaries um, yeah. and even even hire one one or two people. So. 
that was our trick for getting started. Mm. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then John came on board really because uh, we started to get more American clients and I started actually getting out of my shell and networking. I was like super introverted, data geek type guy yeah. before. I still am, but now I'm like good at pretending to be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so yeah, uh, we, we started to get more, more clients, we needed more people on the American side. Uh, John came in as a freelancer, believe it or not, um, and then uh, landed a client for us, and that was enough to pay a salary. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, the good so, thing about the agency uh, model, that's the, that's the easy part, until, until it turns. No, I know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just like, yeah. you know, how many clients do we have and how many people can we afford from that? But like, I mean, it was, it was very nice that like, um, I mean, that, that actually kind of shows where we were at the time. Like, we literally couldn't hire any more people unless we signed the client. Mm. And, and actually, for a lot of the first few years, uh, we'd also have to, like, fire people if we lost the client. So yeah. we were constantly battling that, you know, like, how do we how do we grow without having any cash? And yeah. um, I, I don't know how, how you guys managed it in the early days, but for us, it was just, like, a lot of brute force and, yeah. and like, praying uh, the days leading up to payroll yeah. uh, that we would... Uh, you know, get paid on time and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's it, the, the the balance that's really difficult is wearing both hats where you're like, all right, yeah. today I need to focus on the operational side of the business. I need to manage the contracts and I need to manage payroll early on. And then you're yeah. like, now I got to switch this shit and I got to work out how to build this company and I got to build the full, fun, the full funnel marketing campaign. So it's like, as soon as you start yeah. getting people that have relative expertise in those different areas and it pulls apart, that's when it changes. But then you might lose a client and then you've got to go back into it. So it's quite, it's quite tricky. Exactly. Yeah. And, and also to be honest, my own, like, uh, my own biases and like hang ups, uh, didn't help. Uh, like I always wanted, like, I was like, oh, this, I'm doing ages where I want to build tech. And, uh, you know, I was like drinking the Silicon Valley Kool-Aid and yeah. uh, trying to you know, do all that stuff. But, um, but like, I, I also, I, I kind of felt like I wanted to be more ethical than other agencies. So, that was, you know, led to the stupid decision to like never charge enough margin. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah. And like, yeah, you know, over, over time, I kind of realized that it's not unethical to charge margin because you, you have to, right? Like if you're going to be able to attract good staff and keep them, yeah. um, then uh, you need to mark up their work, you know? And uh, once you see the economics in play and you experiment with different models, you start to realize like most agencies are the way they are because they couldn't be any other way. Yeah, know? entirely. And, and you also realize how good your stuff is, like particularly what you guys were doing. Yeah. And then it's just finding the company that has, is it the right revenue or the right media spend level where you could come in with, you know, a 25K a month retainer. And if, yeah. you know, if they're doing 15, 20 million already, it's, you know, a few percent of revenue. It doesn't take much to generate a really positive ROI on that 25K. So it's also shifting who you're talking yeah, to. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, I would see agencies as kind of an arbitrage against hiring, right? Like, yeah. Uh, if you as a if as a startup, like if you can't hire fast enough, or you're like mostly engineering focused, and you don't have like a very good um, understanding of marketing, I guess. Uh, yeah. Then, because you know we were working a lot with those types of companies, uh, then uh, outsourcing it to an agency makes a lot of sense, and you don't yeah. have to worry about it as much. Um, you know, you don't have to manage someone who you know, as a line manager who, who like does a completely different job to you, it's something that you've never done before. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I think agencies actually have a pretty good proposition and they get slammed a bit yeah. in Silicon Valley because yeah. uh, everyone always likes to say, oh, I agree with the zero marketing, which is like never actually true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, what did you put into product development to have something that clicked? You're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, people always say like Tesla doesn't spend anything on marketing. It's like, no, they have an incredibly expensive marketing budget, which is basically Elon's time, right? Yeah. And his time is probably more valuable than uh, than anyone uh, anyone else's in the world, right? Like, so if he's out tweeting, it does drive ROI for the company, right? Yeah. But, uh, but also, like, you could be building rockets. That would be, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Looking at, based on his, his net worth, uh, his average the average cost for him to produce a tweet versus the average return i think it would be yeah <laughs> very high very high on production but unbelievably high on, on outcome yeah 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 I, I mean they they definitely get a good roi from it right like they wouldn't be able to grow uh, and i'm sure he doesn't actually do it for these reasons right yeah um but i, I think uh, a lot of companies end up in that position where like the company works and they don't necessarily 
you know, look at why, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they just work, like, they just happen to be the type of person that does the right things. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, like, it isn't like Elon's doing a cost benefit analysis every time he you know, sends a tweet. Yeah. Um, he just, like, enjoys tweeting, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he put um, a car in the rocket, right, and sent it to Mars. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a cool thing to do, right? Like, nobody, nobody had to, you know, put together a business plan for that. Right? Yeah. And then that's actually, I think, why a lot of startups can, do marketing a bit better than the bigger companies where you know they would never get that approved yeah right if you pitch that in there, and it's what it is thing. yeah and it's, and, and it's people <laughs> it's people yeah. redefining what marketing is as well so one, one of yeah. the things that you guys did so well this is how i discovered you actually so this was when i was uh oh really yeah is, is the content marketing piece is when i was a marketing director at truva and then we're doing the same mm. thing it's like initially we're like we want to hire all the same people we want to hire the whole team internally and but here's the budget. I'm like, ah, that's going to be really tough. So then I'm Googling. Yeah. Actually, no, I found you guys because I'd taken that role and it was, it was amazing. The team was super, super smart. But there's the moment where I'm like, how the fuck do I actually do this? So then I remember Googling <laughs> it and then, and then finding uh, your amazing content pieces. People should check them out. Uh, Thanks, so, so powerful. Uh, and then I remember talking to one of your, your sales guys. And this is probably when you started optimizing for margin. And I remember hearing about the oh, price. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can't, I can't afford that. Yeah. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it was 10 grand a month or something like that. I was just, I just can't hit that, can't hit that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think the average is probably like 20 now. Um, yeah. yeah. Since I left. But, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, like eventually all agencies migrate to yeah. that level, right? Migrate upwards. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, once you get the right talent that can, can drive the right results, for sure. I'm just saying, am I getting in trouble yeah, for yeah, not being exactly. in the light? We're good. Oh, yeah. So the latter story really really special story and i thought that yeah, we were talking about the content I think. yeah the content the, the 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 way you guys did it was so impressive so can you tell us about the the investment or the strategic focus towards building out your own custom tech and how that went for that agency yeah so um it actually happened you know again most of the stuff happens by accident right but um uh, we, I, I, I at one point quit Ladder because I was like, oh, I don't want to work in an agency for my whole life. And uh, we'd already kind of gotten to, you know, 10 people, 15 people. So I thought like, oh, that's like pretty cool what we've done. Um, and uh, and I got like headhunted by, uh, I don't know if you know, like No Kagan. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. yeah. So really interesting guy. Like, you know, he, like, he wrote quant-based marketing, which is like one of those blog posts. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, you know, I basically built ladder around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the early kind of go attacking people. Um, like he, he was early at Mint. I think their first marketing hire at Mint.com, uh, and he was like employee number thirty at Facebook, right? <laughs> uh, so he, he's like very, very good at uh, pushing out content. Um, and you know, I went to work for him uh, for a few months and helped him scale their Facebook ads. Ended up actually, you know, helping them scale and getting them to. Um, yeah, certain level, but I realized that I was never going to be kind of like CMO at that mm -hmm. company. Uh, and there wasn't as much room to grow. So, um, so I actually <laughs> then went crawling back to ladder. Uh, <laughs> and it was like, okay, I made a mistake, guys. Uh, I was attracted to. Uh, <laughs> I've seen the light. Like, I've repented my sins. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, I mean, what I, what I realized actually is um, the uh, the problems are the same everywhere, mm. like whether you're client side or in house. Uh, but at least in the agency, I could be the master of my own destiny, mm. right? Um, and and like you know, we we parted on good terms. And actually, Noah recommended a few clients to us. Nice. Uh, but um, but yeah, like once I came back into the agency and I was a little bit more mature about my life choices, uh, that's when we started investing in content. Because I had seen mm. uh, one of the things I learned from Noah in just like that short time was uh, producing content is a cheat code. Mm. <laughs> like mm. you. Uh, you put your words out there and people can read them. Mm. They can decide whether they like you or not like before they meet you. So it's just a much more scalable way to have an impact. And um, yeah, we we immediately started investing in content. I even said to, uh, at the time it was uh, John and Alex, uh, what, uh, you know, I, I'll put my salary on this. Like if we hire mm. someone and they don't work out, we're, and we're gonna hire someone full time to do content. And if they don't work out in three months, then I'll pay the salary. Into hey. myself, uh, my salary. There's, there's some skin <laughs> in the game. Yeah, because I was just like, I needed, I was like, we, I know we don't really have that much money. Like, we can't really justify it. We don't know what sales would be like in three months, but, you know, it just needs to happen. Yeah. And 
Um, and funnily enough, it took him almost a month to produce his first blog post, mm. which really scared me. <laughs> you're, you're looking <laughs> at your bank account, you're like, oh, shit, this could get um, me. And, uh, and, and the first post he put out was like, I think it was like two, 200 growth hacking tactics or 200, 200 growth hacking strategies. Yeah. And it was like number four in hacking news that day. Wow. We even got like over 100, we got over 100 leads in one day. Wow. We got like 10,000 visits. It was like insane. It was the immediate ROI. Like, and, and, you know, since then we haven't really looked back. You, did you have, you had a nice moment where you just, after you launched it and the leads came in, you're like, you're not saying anything. You're just like, morning guys, how you doing? Yeah, morning. Yeah, exactly. Nothing, nothing <laughs> yeah, needs I to mean, be said. Um, yeah, I, I didn't expect it to work that quickly, uh, to be honest. Like everyone always says like, oh, SEO is like a six month, 12 month game at mm. least. And and that's usually true. Yeah. Um, but this know, was a distribution you, play, really. Yeah. yeah. Man, yeah. that's, that's and then it was about making it repeatable and and you know getting the publishing cadence up and yeah. um actually the funny thing was like all of our content is really just like repurposed from our training material yeah. because people would ask me questions when I get the same question three times I would just like write a Google Doc on how to solve that problem yeah and then we had like this big library of random collections of my thoughts that uh, I could just pass over to this guy and. Uh, his name was Stefan. Um, yeah, he, he's now like pretty high up at the um, I think. Yeah. Uh, but he, uh, but yeah, he did a great job. Like, got us, uh, like we doubled the agency that year, uh, just purely from all the leads from content. That's that's a really good way to think about it because one of the challenges uh, that we've had or had early on, and I think a lot of companies have when they're smaller, is that how do you manage producing content while you're also going to be executing on partnership deals? Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, client deals. But then you realize that if you're building your company properly, you've, you should have everything baked into standard operating procedures. And then the, the SOPs in this instance, that's the content. Then you can wrap it around, you can pull in some examples, yeah. which you don't need a, a super, super, super specialist to do that, who would be the subject matter expert within the company. Then you get your content. So yeah. it's, it's just repurposing exactly. what you should do internally. Yeah, and, and like I think the trick is, uh, like a lot of people will outsource their content completely and say, I'm going to hire someone to write these articles for me. And it ends up with no substance because they're not like in the field actually doing the work. Yeah. Uh, so um, it just never really has that secret source. Yeah. Um, you can uh, tell. But you can tell. Time, like, you, yeah. yeah. You can't have me just writing everything, right? Like, I, you know, that would be, yeah. you know, <laughs> a disservice to the clients, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, the, that combination of, like me being able to just throw my random thoughts at someone mm. uh, and then them being like flexible enough to just kind of roll with it and piece together and kind yeah. of make, make it into a coherent article. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really key. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind, it's kind of geek out times polish really is the good, yeah. is the good formula. Did you read this stuff? I think the company was PPC hero. They're out of the U S oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you could, you could tell by the passion that people were talking about like negative keyword lists. You're like, this is the guy yeah. or this is the girl that's doing the shit because they're exactly I, I, keep, yeah. I keep swearing they're ecstatic they're ecstatic about what they're doing well i mean you have the word bullshit behind you so. <laughs> <laughs> i think that both sound <laughs> i was i was on a podcast uh where was it after i'd done i'd done a few and then i was i was just like pumped up i was i was feeling it and he's like how's your day yeah. i was like man it was fucking awesome and then he's like, Look, we've, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of people in the ministry that listen to our show. He's like, you can you can tone oh, down the profanity. Yeah. Uh, he's like, oh, we could bleep it out and it will be hilarious. He he was really <laughs> he was a really really good guy. But there, that just got me thinking about it. Mum's listened to yeah. this. Mum's listened to this anyway. So it's the cat's out of the uh, yeah, so my, mom, my mom's from Liverpool. She might mind a bit. Sorry. Maybe I should turn it up. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, amazing. So that that is the. That is the story of Ladder. There's some really, really good bits in there. Let's talk about something filthy. Let's talk about iOS 14. How bad is yeah, it? How bad is it, Mark Taylor? How bad? And it's iOS 15 now as well. Is it? Uh, I need it. I'll update my notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying uh, iOS 14 was when, um, you know, when the shit hit the fan, uh, so to speak, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm just saying they, they had uh, iOS 15, uh, um, you know, they, they just had the Apple Developer Conference yesterday, so uh, they, they just released even more kind of restrictions on what you can do with uh, targeting. Oh, wow. Maybe that would be good. So what's the update with iOS 15? Yeah, so um, it's it's only just kind of coming out a bit more, but like I think the main thing with iOS 15 is you also can't really use emails. Uh, so a lot of people expect 
uh, expected to um, get around the tracking issue yeah. uh, by just joining up people's email addresses and yeah, saying, yeah, like, yeah. okay, you have, um, you know, th- I know that this person is like, you know, the person you purchased because we've got their email address there. Um, you know, Facebook knows that uh, that person's email address is the same. So, you know, to join those two things together. Um, but I think it's this classic arms race, um, right? Like, Every time, um, you know, Apple released something new that will block tracking or before Apple, it was like the ad blockers as well, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, or the, you know, the EU, like GDPR, um, you know, it's it, basically they're going to keep releasing new features that will like block tracking. And then, you know, the ad tech industry are going to kind of try and find workarounds. Um, but, but like, I, I just don't really think that anyone can win that arms race, right? right. Like, it's not it's not coming back <laughs> you know? and even if it comes back uh, temporarily uh, i think tracking will always be broken uh, yeah. from from now on uh, because users inherently don't really like or at least understand um like personalized ads but like they they they're happy to click on personalized ads like we see that yeah. in in our day-to-day jobs but um but you know they don't really like the idea of their privacy being invaded. So um, I, I started looking around last year uh, when iOS 14 was happening, um, or when, when it was being announced. Uh, I started looking around for like, how do you track people if you don't have uh, cookies, right? Like if you can't track user experience, like what did they do before the internet? Yeah, uh, yeah. Because you can't click on a TV ad, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, or like, you know, there's no view through impressions from billboards and stuff, right? So uh, so I, I started looking at this technique called marketing mixed modeling. Um, which, uh, you know, we talked about in the intro, uh, and it really made sense to me. I thought, okay, well, this is actually a way that we can do it with aggregated data. It's completely independent to what Facebook's telling you, to what Google's telling you. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter what Apple does to block tracking. Like, you're always going to know how much you spent on ads. Yeah. And uh, you're always going to know how many sales you made. So, yeah. and that's really, like, all you need uh, to build a marketing mix model. So there are definitely downsides to it, and I've been learning over the past, year and a half how to avoid some of them. But, um, you know, it, it takes a completely different uh, way of thinking about attribution. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think this is really what like everyone's going to be doing. Yeah, they just, they just have to. The rug's been pulled. And it was yeah. it was a, a methodology that I've used a bunch over the last yeah. years, the last few years. And it got to the point where I was like, how much can I trust this shit that they're saying? And this is when this is when things were tracking mm. quite well. When you you yeah. try and model things out, you'd have like a centralized point where you're using like GA or Omnitra or whatever whatever it would be, and the discrepancy yeah. was just so girthy. If that's if that's yeah. the the right word to use, I was like, I just think, yeah. I just think it's I just think there's so much bullshit. I need to know what degree I can trust, and then what the different yeah. levers are that can move that. So we would just look at how much money goes off the credit card, how much money comes back into yeah. the bank account. And then you'd segment it to say how much money are we spending on Facebook, how much money are we spending on AdWords, and then we'd use those platform side metrics to determine it. So it's like revenue went up by fifty percent month over month. What does Facebook yeah. say Facebook did month over month? It's like okay, Facebook yeah. says it only did fifteen percent. Yet Google says it did seventy percent. So you'd look for these macro trends and then just focus on the mm-hmm. things that you know would improve the business. We'd have better landing pages. We'd have uh, better creative. All those yeah. different drivers, and it, and it worked quite well. They work quite well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the that's the way you should do it. To be honest, um, I, I think uh, a lot of people got greedy and and kind of lazy on the last click model because yeah, um, you know, it seems so easy, right? Like this person clicked on an ad and they bought something, so therefore it was the ad that drove it. But when you dig under the surface, and you know, I was doing tracking consulting for the uh, year before or a year after I left left ladder. It, it's crazy when you look at all the discrepancies and you realize like, oh, actually. Um, you know, that affiliate isn't actually driving any incremental sales. What's happening is yeah. that when the customers get to the checkout and it says, do you have a coupon code, then yeah. the user is like going away to Google. Yeah, 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 code. yeah, yeah. And it's like, and, and by being on that affiliate, like, you, oh, yeah, they're driving 10% of our sales. Well, no, they're not. Uh, yeah. It's not incremental. So, yeah. So I think yeah. that actually all attribution is wrong in some way. Yeah. And it's about knowing like how, where it's likely to be wrong and then kind of triangulating multiple methods to really get at what the truth is. Yeah, hundred percent. And the, the, uh, affiliate coupon sites was my favorite example. So yeah. we were using mix panel at the time and oh, yeah. I, my, my approach to marketing is like, da, 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 focus big, do all this kind of shit. And then the balance that I had was, uh, with one of my favorite guys in the world, Abdul Nusrat, and this was at Truva and we were using mix panel 
And we're yeah. working with an affiliate agency and they're like, look, look at our numbers. We're absolutely crushing it. And we're like, okay, what's, what's the distribution <laughs> between category of affiliate? And they're like, oh, there's a lot of stuff with coupon sites, but these guys wouldn't have bought from you at all. And then Abdul, Abdul wages war on these types of challenges <laughs> and the level of depth he was going into in yeah. mixed panel. And we found out that I, I can't remember what it would be. Abdul would know the exact number off his head, even though it was five years ago, but it was something like 750 to a thousand coupon uses. Uh, and zero percent were uh, first click, zero percent, zero percent. I was like, and we showed it to the affiliate agency, and we're like, we didn't know you could do that. And I'm like, you didn't know yeah. it existed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're like, we're gonna have yeah, to ignore it because other yeah, clients, yeah. you've ruined um, our entire but I, I mean, to, model. To, to be honest, though, like, I, I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, if you turn them off uh, and you did like some sort of deprivation test, right, where yeah. you managed to switch them off in a specific region or whatever. Um, you would probably see that there is some incrementality there, right? It's not zero. Like yeah. um, those people who really want to use coupons, are like you know, will uh, buy more if they can get a coupon. They feel like, oh great, now I'm. Or that maybe they'll buy now instead of waiting for a few weeks, right? Like because like, oh, there's a deal on right now. Yeah. So these things do have an impact, but it's not what they say it is, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not zero. It's somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, you know, so so I think that's what marketing mix modeling does. It kind of balances those two things really well. Um, it's not as accurate as doing a deprivation test as like turning it off in some way or doing an A/B test. Uh, but it's also like much easier to do <laughs> than like, you can't A/B test everything, right? Yeah. Uh, you know how much data to start. So marketing mix modeling is really good to kind of glue those two things together. Yeah, and yeah. there's there's the time component as well. So unless you're, yeah. unless you're running a really big test and you're mm. excluding half the country, or we used to take like baskets of states in the US and then just block them out from things like yeah. YouTube. And even then we had, you know, we had the best people uh, from Google's side, from our side trying to crack it. And we just, it was very, very difficult to see big trends. And then you're running this, yeah. the experiments, which are like 60 to 90 days. And you're like, maybe we should have actually just been sitting down and talking to customers, talking to people. Uh, yeah. And running our creative and run five different sets of creative that we could have been splitting across those those exact regions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and like I think people make uh, yeah they, they miss that right. Yeah. Like uh, especially because most attribution is done by analysts, like data guys like yeah. me, right? And they they really they don't, can't really replace that work with going to talk to customers. It's not really their job, or they're not allowed to even maybe in some cases. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, they they also like. They're usually not running the campaigns, so they can't actually do things that would create a better model. Like that's one thing I found being on both sides. Like uh, when I was at Ladder, we we really wanted to figure out for our clients like how much could we scale, like what was the diminishing mm. returns, like we double budget, yeah. uh, what our, what would our ROI look like? And um and, and like the analysts would tell you, oh, you need uh, a lot of variance in the data. You need to be able to draw uh, the diminishing returns uh, graph. Um, and and uh, and they, they would look at the data and say, "There's no diminished returns. We, we don't have the data uh, right now to tell you what that would be." Well, like if you're actually in control of the media, uh, you can just like double your spend uh, for a few days and then and then draw the line, right? Mm -hmm. Like now you actually have like you're almost like generating variance. You're generating the data to yeah. get to a better model. Yeah. Um. So I think that that like when those people are siloed, that's that's like, the worst of all worlds. Like the data person never has enough data. The media team doesn't really know what to do to make a decision or to do yeah. uncertainty. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's it's tough all around. And I think it's if you just kind of um, have those people working in, in concert, then mm -hmm. uh, then you can um, understand how much uncertainty you have, yeah. uh, and therefore like make that decision on the time frame that you need to make. It. Yeah, that's so that's so useful. And I think one of the best things you can do is to get the hardcore quants to talk to customers. Because we, we had an instance where Facebook attribution, which at the time claims, you know, 97% of devices were covered. And they were saying yeah. that, yeah, and across desktop and mobile, because we're, 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 we're perplexed by the multi-device challenge. And they were yeah. saying that, yeah, we had 90% of sales on day zero for a $1,000 product. Which, like, it's just not true. So we'd start triangulating yeah. <laughs> with other quant data sources we had, that we built, and then also with qualitative. So we get the data people yeah. to talk to to talk to Mauve from Idaho to say, what was the process you went through before buying this product? It's like, well, I saw yeah. an ad on Facebook. Then I, this is a real, a real example. Then I talked to my husband. Then I wanted to ask my daughter because she knows how to use the internet. 
yeah, and then yeah. she's like, then we went on holiday to Hawaii and we spent all the money. So we didn't have anything left. And we came back and someone had a wedding. <laughs> and it was like, it was, it was as if you were looking through the, what would be the most beautiful quantitative data set, but it was just Mauve yeah. running through the sequence. And you're like, don't tell me that 90% of people are buying on day zero because I've got Mauve. I've got both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You got proof there. I, I mean, it's like you, you have to take that with a pinch of salt as well because, you know, people don't always like marketing, believe it or not, like isn't top of mind for most people. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it is for us. Um, uh, so they, they might not, they might misremember, but yeah. uh, I think you take enough people in aggregate. Like, I don't know if you do, you do any like post purchase surveys. Loads. Or anything like that. Loads. Right. Yeah. And that, that yeah, was yeah, useful. That, so like, yeah. That, that makes a big difference. Like, um, like I think, like on Shopify, you have different plugins, right? Like yeah. Enquire Labs and stuff that you can put it in, and and uh, that data is always really useful. If people are doing TV, I always recommend that they at least put that survey in, uh, because it, you know, people do remember if they're seeing the TV ad, and your TV won't look like it's performing if you're just kind of looking at, you know, did we get an uplift in traffic when the TV ad was airing, right? Like yeah. that's not really how TV works. Yeah. You know, people watch a TV ad, and maybe they watch it 15 times. Uh, and then eventually they're like, oh yeah, I remember that product. Uh, yeah. Let me search for it. You know? Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, I think I think that's really important too. Hundred percent. And if if people aren't doing it, running post purchase surveys, and we hit them straight away too. It was we we'd split test it whether we'd be running something like a referral program. We'd we'd have a higher oh, yeah. actually. You'd use post purchase upsell one time offer referral, yeah. or we'd do a referral or post purchase question about how they found out about us, how we could do something better. But it's when people are excited and they actually like your brand enough because they've given their credit card over to you. They're really, yeah. really open to sharing some pieces of feedback. So it's extremely useful. But you're right. Yeah, you've, got, you've got to aggregate the data because Move, Move may, have, may have had too many mimosas in Hawaii to have a very detailed account <laughs> of how it went. But that's also why it's useful capturing SMS and email at the top of the funnel. There's like an optimization goal because then you've got that to yeah. get really really helpful exactly and if you've if you've run some you know geo testing and you have your survey um you know and you're talking to customers and you've done a marketing mix model and then yeah. you've also got your like facebook data google analytics or mixed panel data um the truth is somewhere in there <laughs> yeah uh, and it's just about kind of um you know it was almost like a detective right trying to solve the case and, yeah. and like none of these sources are reliable uh but like if you look at all of them you can kind of put together a picture of what must have happened yeah yeah completely and i think the beauty of using uh, a mixed model like this in parallel with qualitative but then also still taking advantage of whatever data we've got on, on channels like yeah. facebook is you, you're gathering enough to say all right what are the bets we're going to make for the next quarter let's hit it yeah. and let's sustain it let's not even worry about facebook if facebook's roas is depleting because maybe it's the tracking error look at aggregate revenue but make a bet yeah and go strong because yeah. so much of the competition now is going to be freaking the hell out because they're just obsessing yeah. over basics of CPA within the Facebook platform. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, actually the CPM is going to be lower, right? Like if people pull back from Facebook, uh, there's your opportunity. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't just suddenly work, work less, right? <laughs> like yeah. it doesn't just suddenly stop working just because you can't track it. Yeah, yeah, entirely. And like the, the amount of historical information they've got, like I'm, um, I'm most bullish on the people that get what we're talking about right and are buying more media and sustaining shitty, yeah. shitty ROASs within Facebook uh, or whatever channel. Yeah. And then overall revenue is good for sure. This is it's a good like, way. Yeah, so you go. And then we're going to segue into VEX. Yeah. Uh, no, I was, I was just going to say that um, the, the everyone makes the mistake in attribution of thinking, I need to know what happened. I need, mm. I need proof of what happened, right? Like what's actually driving sales. And you're just never going to get that. You're never going to have a single customer view. It's just not possible. Yeah. Um, you know, so so I think what they actually need to work on is like, how can I just be a little bit less wrong? Like mm. how can I be less wrong than my competitors? Yeah. Um, like my, one of my favorite phrases is uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Uh. <laughs> you know, it's like, like you know, nobody's gonna, nobody has two eyes, right? But like yeah. if everyone's blind and you've got one, yeah. uh, then, then you have a massive advantage and, and i think that that's uh what the really good brands uh get good at like they 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 can manage uncertainty they can still make decisions even though they don't have the full picture 100 percent, 100 percent. so if you currently have no eyes and you're looking to get yeah. one eye <laughs> you need to check out 
Bum, 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 bum. Uh, <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, no, thanks, for, thanks for shilling my, uh, <laughs> my new product. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah, at, at the end of the day, that's what it's designed for. Like, our first course is on marketing mixed modeling um, because it's just top of mind of what I was finding people needed help for. Like, we have a, we literally have a course called iOS 14 is broken by tracking. What do I do? <laughs> right? There we go. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, all the courses on there are based around real, like, scenarios I had in Growing Ladder or, you know, in, in pre uh, previous jobs or just, you know, when I've talked to people and they've kind of shared like scenarios they've been in uh, and I wanted to make it based on real life because I feel like too many like marketing courses are just like lecture videos. Yeah, right? like, yeah, usually, yeah. You go on YouTube and you watch these or like, yeah, I've, I've created a lot of uh, courses for LinkedIn learning and I think it's good, good content and, and the content in general is really helpful and it's, you know, good value for money. Uh, but like I can't sit there and watch like twelve videos in a row. Yeah. I don't have the patience for that. I start doing something else, or I put it on double speed. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, what yeah. I wanted to do, yeah, it's like get get it. So you know, what, what was really engaging for me? How did I learn? I learned on the job, but mm. obviously not everyone can learn on the job, right? Yeah. Like uh, they don't want to pester their manager and ask them questions. Um, you know, maybe they don't have time to really learn how to do things. They need a cheat code to kind of jump ahead. Yeah. So if you're experiencing one of these problems that we've created a course for, you can just do this course in an hour to two hours. Um, and then it's going to walk you through how to solve the problem mm. with real data that like I've anonymized and kind of, you know, fluffed up, uh, but it like actually solves that real problem in, in the way that I solve, uh, eventually figure out how to solve so it. Cool. So, so, so cool. you know, hopefully it's valuable. Yeah. People, but, it's so uh, smart, man. Yeah. Because it's 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 rare that you can also find clean data sets that you may be able to get access to within your your own company. So then having something like what you've yeah. produced, you straight into the meat, and it's really fun. I do these yeah. things just for fun. Like I'm, I don't I don't yeah, I don't yeah, fix our tracking problems, but I I love this kind of stuff. So I think this yeah. is something that people should definitely definitely check out. And even if you're not within or you're not inside a company, but you're quite technical, you could use this to polish your skills. And you could sell the shit out yeah. of yourself if you're like, look, I know how to fix iOS 14 problems. I know how to fix iOS 15 problems. 16, yeah, exactly. 17, yeah, and you've got the templates you can use and everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, it's about accessibility as well. Like before I, I was just very lucky that I managed to get a good job in marketing. Like, uh, you know, I was trying to get into finance and, and the 2009 uh, crisis happened. <laughs> uh, so, so like no, no jobs in finance. And I was just lucky that I landed in a Google Ads role where I was, you know, running ads for a car phone warehouse and, you know, they're trusting me with 10, 10 grand a day. Mm -hmm. But like most people can't get in one of those roles. So like, how do you get the experience of running a 10 grand a day account uh, without actually, you know, being trusted, right? You can't, you can't get the job without experience, but you can't ex get experience without the job. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so that's the problem I really wanted to solve with this as well. Um, like we kind of take you behind the scenes and give you that data that you can play around with. So when you do actually go into the interview, you can feel confident you know yeah. how to do that job. Yeah. And, and I think what people will find interesting too is that I bet both of us have managed tiny budgets and then very, very big budgets. Yeah. The bigger budget's easier because you've, you've, oh, so, yeah. you've, you've got far more conversion data. So you can do something uh, like Vex, you'll get you'll get the confidence to do it. You'll get the you get the templates and the tools and and the experience yeah, to do it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's the thing actually. It's not rocket science, right? Like, um, I think that's the thing that people miss, and that's why I always try and impart it to junior marketers when I'm talking to them. They think, oh, well, that grand, that brand is spending twenty grand a day, fifty grand a day. They must be really smart, mm. and they are smart, right? Like, you don't get into that job by not knowing what you're doing. Uh, but it's not they're not like 10 times smarter than you they're yeah, like 10% yeah. smarter than you or maybe about the same intelligence but just further along in their career right yeah uh, so um you know the stuff they're doing in some in some cases is actually worse than what you're doing yeah uh you, you're probably having to work a lot harder with a small budget and like optimize a lot harder uh, yeah. than they are um yeah. you know so uh, you know, they've got a big brand behind them right like when we started doing ads for bonzo uh, it was like the best performing ad we've ever run. And it's not because like we we're amazing at ads. Like I thought we did pretty well with them, but but it was just because Monzo already had it. They're a yeah. really, really good brand that yeah, people loved. Entirely. Yeah, the conversion rate was insane, right? So it's like, like I think that's what people don't realize. They expect these people to be rocket scientists and they're just not. Uh, and, and if you can experience the way that they do the work and if you can actually talk to some of these people like I did, uh, then you get to see that, oh, it's actually achievable. Like I could be one of these people.
Yeah. Uh, and you get that confidence, just actually knowing that the bar isn't as high as you think. Yeah. Yeah, entirely. And I think the other piece of advice we can give people, do this stuff for sure. Like I, I learned so much. Yeah. My, my first book was like HTML for dummies. I'm like, I just, I want something where I'm yeah. building this shit as I'm learning it. Uh, the, other pe- the other thing that people should do is uh, check out Growth Mentor. So I had a really fun chat with Foti. And when, oh, yeah, when you're making like a transition. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was our first chat. We, we mm. both mentored each other. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we were both mentors, weren't we? Yeah. But uh, uh, just from different kind of backgrounds and stages. Uh, yeah. But- I think at the time I was uh, I was asking Foti like, who else on the platform is really really good to talk to, and uh, you were like, yeah, top five. <laughs> so, oh. um, that could be blush, man. Yeah, but it's it's a good place that people should check out because I think back to my career, I was hammering my own self learning to build technical skills, <laughs> and then I was wishing I had something like uh, Growth Mentor or like Clarity, which I still use Clarity a bunch to try and see. Yeah you worked at that company? I'm like, what was it actually like managing those budgets? And they're like, it's yeah. actually not that hard. Like if, if they're hammering shitloads into TV and top of funnel, I sort of like brand awareness, all of the, all of the FB stuff I do is, is not very difficult because you just, you're just scooping up retargeting pools. It's really, really not yeah. that hard. But yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. There's, um, actually, there's a really funny story I had from uh, one of my great mentor talks. Uh, I was talking to this guy and he, he's like really ambitious junior marketer, kind of, you know, uh, imposter syndrome uh, through the roof, right? Uh, and, uh, and he was like, I just actually want to kind of ask you about another mentoring call that I had with someone because uh, I just don't really understand the situation. I just want to understand if it's normal. And uh, he had had a call with uh, someone who was in one of the, I'm not going to name like the specific company, uh, but it was like, you know, at one of the bank uh, like level companies, right? Yeah. So like, um, you know, similar size to like Facebook, Apple, Etc. Right, and um, and he said that he talked to the CMO uh, who he wanted to mentor him, and he said like, how do you decide how much to spend on marketing? And he said, oh, the CEO just gives me ten percent of revenue. Yeah, yeah. And then he it was he was like like shocked and like dismayed to find this out, right? Like he was like, oh, I can't believe that this massive company is making billions of dollars. They don't know they they don't use any science to figure out how much to spend on marketing. They just take ten percent. Yeah, and. Yeah, and, and and like actually, my advice for him was that's rational. Um, they might not seem that way, but uh, but like you know what that person does, like that brand is like you know, over ten years old. Like yeah. what that person does this year in marketing isn't really going to be the main thing that drives sales. So yeah. uh, they need to do marketing, but it's probably not like a huge priority in terms of like measuring the output of that marketing. Yeah, um, and it's it was a, kind of like a good lesson in actually like. Sometimes you don't have to measure everything. Like sometimes you don't have to have science back to you yeah. for everything. If it's not that important of a decision, uh, then you know, like if the, the truth might be eleven percent or it might be nine percent, it's the right amount to spend. But who cares? Like yeah. just set it at ten percent and move on to the next big problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is really, really useful when people find that out. But to know that they should be talking to companies that are representative of what they're they're working on versus these. Yeah, exactly. Guys. Yeah, because it's a board decision. Yeah. That's, a, that's something that's probably done, you know, a year ahead, signed off. All right, bump it up to 11. You did well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mean um, I think also people really overestimate the impact of marketing. Um, like, obviously, for small startups, if you switch on Facebook ads, uh, your revenue goes through the roof, yeah. uh, you know, pretty much straight away. And, like, you don't even need attribution, right? Yeah. Um, like, there's a brand I did a marketing mix model for, and um, I found out that 90% of their sales came from either Facebook or TikTok. Wow. <laughs> right? yeah. And, uh, you know, that's what Facebook and TikTok were claiming, but, like, we proved it. And, and uh, uh, you know, they, they basically wouldn't have customers otherwise uh, yeah. because they're just not, not well known. Yeah. Um, so I think when you're a marketer and your experience is mostly with smaller brands, when you get up to bigger brands, you don't realize that, like, Marketing only drives like a fraction of a percent of sales um, for for the bigger brands. Mm. Uh, it's it's actually the fact that like someone knew them when they were a child. They, they knew that brand when they were a child growing up, yeah. and that's why they're buying the product today. Yeah. Um, you know, like Cadbury's. Uh, like we, we I just went to Cadbury's World with my daughter and my wife uh, recently, uh, and and like you know why did I get buy a ticket to Cadbury's World? Right. Like it's not because I saw an ad about Cadbury's this year. I don't think <laughs> yeah. I've seen any ads on yeah. this year. Um, it's because like my parents bought me Cadbury's when I was younger, right? Like their marketing is important, but like 
not that important yeah. <laughs> to their overall sales. Yeah, entirely. It's so amazing. Thanks so much for coming on the show and thanks so much for building Vex Power. Uh, check it out, everybody. It's truly, truly a phenomenal tool. And we're going to aggregate all these different nuggets of wisdom that we've gone through today into the show notes. And that's it. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. That's the Grow Shop Show. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day.